and until then, I'll just hand it over to you. All right, thank you. Well, um, I'm doing a case study with that on another stuff. So this within, uh, we were asked to read that we, this book and explain to you guys. So I will share in the chat a database that we are going to work on that if you fancy to do it. It's not going to be that hard in theory. Oh, wait, I forgot. Oh, oh sorry, technical problems. Do, do, do. Uh, farming. Uh, do, do. Here. All right. So it will be nice if you can download it and open it. I'm going to explain a bit uh, about the database. Uh, all right, and we're going to start with this. Everyone can see my screen. Yes, no? Yep, looks fine, it's perfect. Oh, perfect, thank you. First time I use Teams. Uh, well, uh, as Cynthia said, we are going to speak about the chapter three of statistical properties, spatial and correlated data of this book. Person. Um, this book is really hard in concepts, so I try to do the best that I can to put like uh, the most graphical way to explain the concepts. I couldn't dedicate enough time, or at least not as I would like to do it. So some of the graphs are going to be a bit rough, so apologies for that. But all right, the first one step that we want to see is like the first law of geography that it says like everything's related to everyone else, right? But but near things are in the space more related are going to be. And an uh, example that is quite good is if I saw from my window there is raining, um, probably at the office it's going to be raining as well, but the probability is raining in uh, Newport or Telford is going to be lesser. Could be, but it's going to be lesser. And probably it's not going to be related with the cloud that is raining in the moment uh, here because the distance is a bit longer. All right. Important concept. Uh, keep that in mind because we are going to use it later. Another important concept. Uh, I just put these hashtags everywhere. Is this uh, definition of, of autocorrelation? I just copy paste this because it's quite good understandable. But I did this graph just to explain it better. And autocorrelation is another word to do correlations, but it's going to be space dependent or time dependent. I'm going to close my window for this. Just someone is chopping the grass now. Sorry for that. Um, here we're going to use like the space dependency, right? So basically um, the results that we want to have is the same as the correlation. So a value between negative one and one. Where negative one right is um, a negative correlation and one is a positive correlation but what does this mean right and i'm going to do two examples one really stupid just to fix the concept where with me and another more technical imagine if you are like doing two mini things right on here and another one is going to be these cases. That is going to be the extremes. Minus one, plus one. The zero, there is no correlations. Imagine that you're doing a meeting where it's like people who doesn't know each other very well. So they are going to try to randomly make some groups, but there are not any relationship within those. And it's more like 
random effects that something that is a grouping the people together, right? So that will be the effect of not correlation. Now imagine this. Uh, Joe is making a farmer's meeting because I know that I see that, that stuff. But he make the mistake of show, um, of put like several people for several production systems. So for example, there is a pork intensive breeder here. There is going to be a poultry breeder here. There is going to be me here after a, like an afternoon of work. And the problem is like, when you're working in an intensive production system, you're trying to generate some smell, but are like different to each other. I cannot sense my own smell, but I can send to the other one. So I will try to keep distance and everyone is going to be doing the same. So here is kind of a um, chess war because every point is trying to be as far as I can of the other one, in this case for the smell. Right now, the pub open. There is the bar. All the guys go to look at the beer. There is going to be an effect. There is the beer and the farms like here. So everyone is going to stand together, and this is going to be a, a maximum correlation. There is going to be one or one hundred percent. Right? It's kind of a funny joke, but hopefully explain well the concept when. There is no correlations. Every point in the space tries try to be as far as possible. So the other one have a negative effect. Or they are trying to uh, get together in the space. It was kind of understand that or they need like more explanation. OK, I will assume that everyone understands. So anyone fancy to make like a more technical approach, an example of those? Or I should do it? No, I think I think it's good. Your explanation is good. I put, I put a graph in there, one that I had just happened to draw earlier, talking to some other people about spatial autocorrelation too, but I think we're good. Let's go forward. Oh, OK. Well, the, the, the technical things that I will put up here is the alfalfa take this stuff because half alfalfa or medical sativa have uh, allelopathic um, molecules that it drop to the soil and try to kill every plant, including the alfalfa. So the alfalfa, when it's old, is going to have like some steps of alfalfa in the space. And this will be like any crop with nitrogen is going to be more developed when it's nitrogen, right? So, oh, another stuff. In the real world, this autocorrelation, the negative one, is really weird. And to find an example, well, I used the example of the book, but it's not as easy to think an example to the uh, to to have like a negative correlation is far more common to have a, a positive one. So when people are, uh, start to speak in, in the everyday like talks, autocorrelations, they are like trying to find like the um, positive one. They are referring this one, not this one, right? Well, with that declaration, uh, yeah, here, this, this is the deal. The book was, was talking about that database that I couldn't find. So I start to, I was about to ask, uh, but then I, I just like, we can do something fun. We can do like another database and do the same as the as the book said. And I pick three, two was uh, with copyrights. Um, well, this one, as well have copyrights, but the copyrights are on my name, so I don't care. Um, the database that I sent is um, in the in the uh, oh sorry Excel document that I sent in the chat, right? 
So basically, this is the thing. This is was an essay uh, made with corn. There is different treatments. We are not going to enter in detail of that. But um, this is these are the plots, and this is the yield of the corn plant, right? From the base, it's like in kilograms per hectare, and is um, the whole plant. Not only like the rain, right? So we have the maps and we have like the data more or less about the yield, right? So when we start to speak about spatial correlation, the first thing that we need to do is have a coordinate system, right? So I create a fake one. I was going to use the real one but it was going to be a bit complex because the numbers are quite long. So it's easier to put in here like one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. If you say like it is a strange way to arrange the coordinates, it is, but bear with me because if not, uh, R can be a bit mad with that because uh, this kind of statistical design wasn't thinking to do whatever the, the thing that I was I'm going to do now. We are going to do actually. So and just to be clear, I know it is obvious, but just to be clear, when I say one four, I refer like this plot x1, y4, right? Then in this case it will be a white north and x it will be west in the coordinate systems, right? If you are going to read some satellital information or stuff, uh, or initiative, be careful because be aware that there is different systems of uh, coordinates. There are like several that are like, quite different to each other, and you are going to realize when you say the numbers, but they are quite other ones that are quite similar. So be careful with the transformations. Every shell taste in the um, metadata is going to set which kind of like um, system, like coordinate system. Uh, if there is, you have to work with two shell teeth on two different uh, uh, coordinate systems, R can change it. And there is some web page that you just have to upload the, the HOT and then download with the on your other system that you want. It's quite easy. Well, clarify that. One of the things that we're going to see and try to find is trends, right? Well, here I just put some colors like green is the top production, yellow, it will be something like average. Uh, the medium 50% and the red ones will be the last 25%, right? So anyone can tell me, just look in the map, where is the trend, where is like the best um, hills in the map? Right, you are shy. Well, it will be more or less like here, right? In this side and this side, there is like the the like the top um, yields on the crop, and here, except for like a couple of exceptions, are the lesser uh, or the less yields. And that's a problem because if we saw the treatments, for example, this treatment doesn't have much nutrients and it still have a, like a big yield. So we can we we uh, have to do some stuff to to correct that effect. And one of the things that we did was going to the field and characterize the soil of each plot, right? So this is the database, more or less, that I send you. Can I can I make a comment um, on this graph? 
<clears throat> um, <clears throat> I was looking at your legend, and um, I think that's an astonishing range of variation for yield. Uh, in the low end, six thousand; on the high end, twenty-two thousand. Yes, it is, <laughs> and there is some explanations it's... for that. Okay. For example. Okay, I'll be patient until we come to that. <laughs> uh, no, no, it wasn't going to be here, but T1 was the witness. I mean, there was like any treatment or any nothing application here. Uh, and there was in the worst soil. I should say that this is like three blocks, right? And the treatments are randomly distributed in each block. And this part of the soils is really bad, and we are going to see why. And okay. this is really good. I mean, why? And that affects a bit the, um, the treatments. Okay, cool. Mainly the problem that we have here is that it's like a lot of sodium, the water, the infiltration of the water wasn't great, and the ma organic matter was really, really low. Everything because uh, the slope, but I wouldn't want to get that. So we have here our fake X and I, the parcel number, the treatment number. Uh, well, the application, they will be like a mineral source of nutrition, or an organic source of nutrition, the blocks, the old, um, NPK that was extracted from the plant. And then here we have like data of the um, free of the data we take of the A horizon of the soil. Uh, this is stands for organic matter, but it should be organic carbon. That was a mistake that I made. If you want to know the organic matter value is you have to multiply for 1.725. This is, um, no, I have like the description here. Uh, the only some thickness and the penetration resistance, right? We're going to work now with the organic matter because I already did like the stuff and this is what we need to do. It, right? So, um, now, a bit of a side note. I didn't do the glossary when I did this for like first times five or six years ago. And I, when I start to read the Excel, I have a, like a really good memory. I remember like almost everything, but I have a bit of confusion up here. And I remember Ed in my head saying, you actually do what I did that. You are going to see this database years before and you are not going to remember not anything. And I was like, oh yeah, he was right. I didn't know it at the time, so okay. But this is important. Um, all right. Everyone know how to upload an Excel. So um, I encourage you to start to doing that if you want. This map, um, we are going to transform this map in a matrix. In which sense? We have the coordinates that is going to be here. And the values, in this case, this is yield, right? Um, and we are going to work with a matrix, right? Because within a matrix, we can do operations with a picture, don't. And if we, and actually, if we see a picture, uh, sorry, here it should be rasters. You are going to see like when you take a picture, you basically are recording uh, the green, the red, the green, and the blue values, right? So you are creating a matrix as well. This is a single one um, raster, right? There actually is a matrix with the coordinates that is going to create colors in a range. Or you can start to work with multibands. That is basically loads, in this case three, matrix one next to each other. And you can do operations with that as well. I 
bring it, this is wasn't in the book, but when you start to work in with um, geostatistical data, and, uh, geographical data, it's really possible that you're going to receive uh, rasters, right? Or points um, or polygons, but many rasters. When you're um, viewing like a satellite or, or a picture, a drum picture, is a raster as well. And a raster is no more like one or several matrices that we can make math with that. Everyone understand that? Okay. All good here. So we're going to calculate the trend because when we see this, I mean, we suppose there was a trend by just eyeballing, right? But we can do some maths with the matrix and calculate the trends. So whew, this is not possible, not animated. When we find one of these formulas, we have mainly two options, run away or just bit step by steps, right? So we're going to do the second one. Um, we have here the deterministic trend, right? It's going to be the thing, right? That uh, is going to determine the trend. In our case, it will be the organic matter. Uh, organic carbon, sorry. Here is going to be some random processes of the special uh, autocorrelations. Remember that as well, there is uh, this could be for um, a spatial calculation or time calculation as well. And this is um, uncorrelated data that is not going to be in the variable, right? So let's start to doing this. And I strongly encourage you to start to copy this code in your own R because it's very easy. Basically, I just call these two libraries. Well, this was the, um, the library that um, import the, the Excel. I call my variable con. Well, this is where it was. And I did this because I have a problem with my ex, uh, Excel. So I define again the X and I uh, coordinates. All right. So if you want, can I, I can uh, can clarify? Um, you do you want people to code along with you now? Yes, okay. if they want. Are you going to drop in the um, Excel file for us? Yeah, it's in the chat. Well, I don't see anything in the chat. Did you click the uh, arrow also? Does anybody else see anything in the chat? <laughs> no, I just, it's a man in the chat. Just oh, you need to click the little arrow there, and then oh, we'll just... sorry. There we go. Okay, it should pop up for everybody in a moment. It hasn't for me yet, but um, give everybody a chance to. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I really thought that it was in it. Yeah. And to be honest, before coming here, I just think like, uh, I should send it to you before that shows that they have like in the. No problem. no problem. We have time to get people on board. I still don't see it. Um, how big is the file? Is it real big? It shouldn't be that big, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll give it a moment. Uh, 17 megabytes. Okay. All right, it's going to, uh, there we go. It's just popped up. Cool. Give everybody just a moment who wants to follow along. Well, in the middle time, if you want to see here, what's the essay? All right. Mm -hmm. I had to open just to put the, some coordinates, right? Oh. Wait. Should be here. But uh, I can give you two minutes um, to download the file and write this code. It's really yeah. easy. Just if you could, copy, you, could, you could even copy and paste the code into the chat as well. That would yeah. Help. I would hurry it along. Don't judge my. Oh, script no. that is 
squad. We're not, we're not at all judgmental here. So it's, it's fine. It's quite bad. But still is working. West teams here. Pick. Perfect. So the only thing that you have to change is the directory that probably is going to be download. So if anyone finish the importation of the data, just give me a shout. And now I have successfully done it, but there's a chance that I'm a bit faster than some people. And also people may have to install spatial and read, read Excel, but I already have both of those installed. Uh, yeah, highly probably you are faster than everyone else, but spatial is really fast to install, to be honest. Yeah, okay. Um, read Excel is pre-installing. Maybe let's give, uh, you know, another minute. And then if people still need a little more time, just just put a uh, more time, uh, yes, a y, a y in the chat if you need more time, but uh, we'll give it another minute and then carry on. Just to let you know, um, this part is just for data, Excel. I think that everyone knows that. Oop. Here, I always try to put a sheet that is color just to import the data, pick, and copy paste, and paste here, right? I think we're good to go when you are. All right. Well, first of all, we're going to try to make a matrix with this. Right, so we are going to grab Y real. Why? Because it was like how it was in the book, basically. And we're selling is going to be a matrix, but not of the entire Excel, not the entire database. Of the database, I will want just the values of the organic matter or organic carbon, right? And in row, the number of rows of the matrix will be six. Because are like six plots, plots by six, right? It's like this. Well, this will be five by five. In our case, six by six. We understand why that six. And then we are going to plot it, right? For doing that, we are going to put like perspective or pers x, y are the coordinates, right? Y real are the matrix. Tetra and P is going to, as this is going to be a 3D plot, it's going to see the angle that we can like um, display that, that data, right? So you can play with that. I just put 240 because it was really quite good, but you can play and put whatever. The scale fails because uh, if you put through, it's going to auto uh, rescale the, the graph in each axis and it's going to be a cube. And sometimes it's quite hard to see the difference. So it's good to put like phase, uh, fails. And if you want to do a really nice graph and maybe overcomplicate, you can put shadows through. And it's going to be like a shadow effect. But that's optional. All right. Um, I will copy and paste my ideas that you guys just. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. So this is going to make a 3D graph with the XY coordinates on the bottom and the Z axis is going to be your Y real and uh, the theta and the phi is the rotation of the graph and the tilt. 
the idea was that they can discover each other. Ah, I just copied. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, about about sorry about that. Sorry about that. I cut out with the bags. Uh, copy. Just copy paste in the chat the goal. So, um, what is it here? Okay. So when you finish with this, according to this, you should grab a graph. Probably a bit different than mine because um, you can change this just to play with that. I highly recommend that. Um. What happened here? Oh, sorry. Well, there is. I want to show the goal. I just lose it. Um, the positive. Oh no, it's fine. Sorry. Then we can model this trend, right? And graph us as well. So we, the uh, way to model this trend. Is going to be what this function is native from R and it stands for a linear model. So we are going to name it model point link because stuff. And the model is going to be the um, uh, organic carbon explained by the X and Y coordinates. The data will be corn, right? So remember that the first law of geography. Right, we are going to try to explain the organic carbon by the position of each uh, plot. Okay, to see if there is something there. So we can see the coefficients of that. Remember, there is as a, um, a linear model. It will be like y is displayed by. Um, the first coefficient multiplied by the um, organic carbon value plus y, right? Or like the independent um, coefficient. We're going to use the, oh, no, sorry, the predict function to predict the model because now we just have like a mathematical formula. Now we are going to have um a prediction list right of each value of the model we're going to transform that in a matrix just to can like um play with that again the number of rows is going to be six because we have a matrix of six by six we are going to call fit we are going to multiply it by four this just we can do it by another numbers, but four is kind of a good number just to see it really good. Uh, the values of organic matter are quite low, so it would be nice to have like a bit of an increase to see it in the graph. And then we are going to graph it at the exactly same time is um, way than in this one. Basically, it's the same line, but I change here. Uh, instead of y real, just the fit. And I change this value so to see like a bit better, right? A scale uh, should be false. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so when you finish coding, you should uh, have this stuff. This is already the real values of the organic matter, right? Represented in uh, in the soil in a 3D plot, and this is the trend. Okay. Anyone has something different than that, except for the position or like the shadows that you can put. Well, I will assume that not. Anyone just put in the chat or shout. Um, so there is some difference between these. There are some high values that are not explaining it. That is going to be the errors, right? But just let's see this. The high uh, values here on the trend 
the organic matter are in the high uh, lowest i values and the highest x uh, values that more or less coincide oh sorry is this lower y values higher x values this sounds of here have more organic matter. Like if you saw the soil and the slope that you have, have kind of a logic because the slope goes this way and this is like an accumulation zone. But that's an explication why. But this is the trend that we can see it here, right? I could explain why there is like that variation of the results. All right. So. We can calculate a bit of those. This is the same, sorry. We can calculate the effect of this, but here we have to uh, explain some concepts just to understand what we're going to do. And one is like, the Monte Carlo thing, right? Is a statistical thing that we can do. Basically, is if I have an experiment and with the help now with the computers, we can repeat the experiment with random values a large number of times, and we can see the distribution of the results of this experiment, right? In R, we can use this with a function replicate. I'm not going to under, um, just get into the code because it's really simple, but I, I like to uh, understand the concept. It's kind of like flipping a coin or just drop some a coin in soil and I know the result 1,000 times, 10,000 times, 1 million times. Is Actually, a really uh, easy exercise to do. And um, well, I'm not going to say why it's important yet here, but it's really important in our subjects like, uh, well, economists use it a lot, basically um, for risk assessment and model prediction of what is going to happen in the future with the economics values. And as well, um, Oh no, that name just flip out the main. It was it was Monferoni, uh, uh, the first statistical person who was like kicked out from the casinos. That he invented like a succession through Monte Carlo systems to always win in one of the casino games. All right, you can go it, or I can send an email if you are interested in just to do in the casino. But oh, that's good. We want to hear about Bonfroni now. <laughs> uh, basically, he developed a method and proved mathematically that he can always um, win in the spinning wheel, but there was a catch. You didn't know what, how much money you're going to uh, need. You didn't know how much will be your profit and in how much time. So through the Monte Carlo, she run several probabilities of results at the same time, and he can calculate the mean of how much money will be needed to win in each casino. And we, then when he find like a good one with the statistical probabilities uh, through observation plus the amount of money that he can use to replicate the experiment, he starts to go, he starts to win like a lot of money. The casino just realized that everyone, like that guy always came in the night and always grabbed some profit. They didn't find out how they did it, but they just said like, you cannot enter anymore here. I was in the States, in, in Las Vegas, so, 
apparently there's like a list of people that are spanned to enter to the casinos because they can't tend cards and stuff. And he was one of the first statisticians to be banned to Las Vegas casinos. And after being banned, he published the, the article of how to win in the casino every time, basically. He didn't say that it was for a casino, just put like the formulas. Then the story get like a bit popular with the media. Uh, I will check it out that I have like in my maths notes and I have a scan it. So if there is anyone interested, I can send the story. Another thing that we should know is student T test that was invented by Guinness, not by Guinness, but uh, to produce Guinness. So it's important stuff, right? So it's really, really simple. It's kind of an ANOVA. The main difference is like uh, the student T test is used to compare the means between two groups and the ANOVA for three or more groups. So is for more simple experiments, right? On R, the fusion of the T student is T test and is quite similar to the ANOVA, is really easy to do. The important stuff here that is valid uh, for the T test as well as the ANOVAs is the errors, right? So imagine that we have um, or a pipe about hypothesis, right? A hypothesis. So we have mainly two options, right? The hypothesis in the reality is true or is false. And we, through the experiments or whatever, and the statistical analysis, we can reject the hypothesis that we formulate or don't reject that, right? So if we don't reject this, uh, the, um, the null hypothesis, and it was true, so we're good. Or if we reject that, and in the reality was false, we're good. The problem is what happened when was true and we rejected, or was false and we rejected. And what that is going to call be like error type one and error type two, right? It's basically that, um, we are going to have false positives or false negatives, right? We want to understand that. This table is from the book. I just forgot to cite it. All right. This is, I mean, I am going to assume that everyone knows that it's quite basic, but still was. Uh, now it's just, just give a refresh as the book is doing the same as well. Oh, so we're going to do a little experiment. If everyone wants to, we're going to set a seed. There is going to be whatever. I just choose one, two, three. That was in the book. When we set a seed in our, um, we actually have, we are fixing the random stuff. We are going to generate random numbers through the Monte Carlo, right? But it will be nice to everyone have the uh, same results. So when we say like set a seat to R, we are like, all right, it's going to be random, but everyone that is going to run the call is going to have the same random numbers. Everyone understand that? So everyone can have like the same result. So we are going to fix a lambda that is going to be 0.4. I'm going to explain that later. We are going to make a function called the test, the lambda. Um, well, we're going to do like numbers between 1 and 20. And we are going to basically try to recreate the test through functions, right? And we're going to try to find the type one error. That is the false positive. That is the worst one, right? So we create this function. We are going to replicate this function uh, 10 thousand times, right? Replicate this 
Very really simple. How many times? What? Done. And then we are going to ask the mean of the 10,000 results of the t-test, uh, the mean value of e word that it will be the equivalent of this. Um, oh, sorry. The mean standard error and the sample standard deviation of e word. There is going to be um sample standard deviation of this one okay do it uh we're going to see here that the type one error is one uh, point one nine right ninety percent that means that ninety percent of the time a bit more we are committing the first type one error that is a, a false positive and that's far more than the set in general they accept 0.05 so keep that in mind we're going to use it later we, I, we, right so we are going to try to do some autocorrelation right with the real numbers now because this this was something that we create this we're going to use the real data that we have all right so if we, anyone want to go with me just let me know we are going to use this library these two libraries right um a little note in the book is uh, like just using this one, but we are going to use a function that is this one that I'm not going to pronounce it, just probably I can't. Um, it's not anymore in this library since last year, if I don't mal remember, and we changed it to this one. Both libraries are really fast to install, it's less than a minute if you fancy to go with me or well replicate the code. Uh, I will copy them and paste it in the chat in a moment. So what we're going to do is calculate the trend of the linear model by using another formula because the, this one was quite simple, right? And we're going to try to calculate the lambda with that. So we're going to use the covariance, right? of like the organic carbon explain with the spatial um, information of the coordinates i saw on the internet there is a lot of formulas and a lot of ways to put in this but mainly are the same it's kind of a gaussian square of the equalization of the x and a axis right the data is corn right we are going to create another column go like um organic carbon um data table and we are going to say like all right we want the true the difference between the true variables less the prediction that we just made here right so we don't choose predict and the linear model is just we write. Everyone understand that. We basically the only thing that we did was a linear mode. We predict the values of the linear mode, and we subtract those the real values by the predict ones. Everyone is okay with that. Can I can I just say it back in my own words? I think you've said it perfectly clearly. It's a lot for people to take in if this is kind of a new way of thinking, you know. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I just left a lot of information. To be honest, that chapter is really good to read and explain like in more detail that I'm yeah. losing because I didn't have like an hour and yeah. I have five minutes. And we are going to be 
finished. Don't worry. Yeah, we'll be finished. If I say back in my words, what you what you've yep. done here is you've made a linear model, you've made a prediction that's like the line of the regression, and what you're doing here is you're just comparing the uh, prediction to the actual observed values to look at the difference, and you'll look at that um, you know spatially as well. Exactly. Well, once we do that, we have to put in a coordinate systems, right? So we have X and Y, but for R, it's just more data, and we have to specify that that are coordinates. So we are going to put X and Y. If there were like the real ones, it would be okay. If there is a sub coordinate systems, there is another thing that we, you can do that is just put the zero value right and it's going to transform in another coordinate system that is quite cool to do it uh, then we're going to create a neighborhood list so mainly which is close to which one um in order to do that we have to put a scale on that right so r is going to ask you which is the lowest distances that is almost always zero and what is the longest one? In this case, is the length of the essay that is 62 meters, right? This was um, in meters. Okay. First time I did that, I didn't. Uh, I thought it was kilometers, and the values were like which really one. When I tried to do the map, but no worries. So. We are going to do the autocorrelation now. We are going to make with this function that is in this package uh, style v. Uh, this the, that's the only part that I didn't understand of the code. Uh, we are going to do a um, proximity list, right? I think the style is more like the type of operation that we're going to do. We are going to calculate the y model with this function, right? And it's going to have like um, the organic carbon data table to one data corn. Uh, this is um, if we want to put a li another list of coordinates, as uh, we are going to use the weights. We just had to put like list W equal W. And it's not the the R is not assuming that. So if you don't put that, it's going to have like an error message. And we are going to print the lambda, right? This is one way to do it. This is another way to do exactly the same. This is going to be a small differences, right? Within that. And I got like the lambda value is point. Uh, 8825, and this is oh, it's different. I don't know why. This is the letter lambda, lambda, right? So this value is basically whoa, this one. Okay. So it will be around here. So we can say that there is a positive correlation, a quite strong, and if we think have sense because we are like correlating organic matter with the distances that they, we are, they have in there. Um, this soil, there was a, um, a grassland for like last 20 years, shouldn't have like big differences in the organic matter according to the space difference. And the main difference, and I'm going to just tell you what, is that here there is like uh yeah here there is high sodium concentrate that disperses the organic matter and that sodium is came because the by the slope the water just accumulate here right so that oh sorry kind of have sense now this is a nice exercise to grab like the autocorrelation. The question is, this 
will affect my treatments? And the answer will be no. Uh, we did some covariance analysis and then we think about that and make the um, mineralizations um, calculation and the treatment uh, of nitrogen, the maximum treatment was 40 times more nitrogen uh, in the application. That the difference of the mineralization between the worst part of the field with the uh, best one. So, okay, but this value have have sense. Um, I didn't find like bibliography doing all this stuff. So, okay, but have some sense. So I don't know if there anyone has questions on that. I try to do as possible, as uh, simple as possible, because that's if you start to be do like the math itself could be a bit frustrating. So I try to keep like the concepts of stuff. But the formulas are in the book and everyone have the book. So William Grosset. Ah, yes, sorry. Um, so if anyone have any questions or they want to know another stuff about that. Thank you, Herman. Uh, questions, comments from anyone? I think um, <clears throat> I think this is a a lot of ground to cover. You're right, and um, the author of this book. A thing I love about this book is that, um, like I said uh, before, you started going. The there's a lot of subtlety in this. And uh, the author is really good at making it clear. I really like some of the touches in your presentation. Um, uh, the story about Bonferroni, I, I just love. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this concept of um, the spatial autocorrelation is probably the most important thing in this chapter. And this nice little method of visualizing it, the, these 3D graphs are not very pretty they're, and they're hard to think about, but uh, they're very useful just as a quick test of um, of observations versus um, predictions. And, and this this little trick of um, of uh, looking at the differences, it's really timely for some of us that are in the chat because we're we're working on a, a modeling exercise exactly like this. <laughs> we're doing it. We're visualizing it very differently. But your um, your pictures of um, the uh, the field experiment are very similar to the way that um, that uh, we we've been working on to visualize uh, down to single plants. You you have fields where we have single plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, any comments or questions? Really appreciate that. Um, could I ask? Uh, I think people probably will be interested whether or not they um, <clears throat> ask for it. Is could you just uh, send me or drop your um, slides in the script into the chat and I'll put it up on the website. It's OK yeah. if um, if you're worried about the formatting, don't be worried about the formatting. It'll just be a it'll help people who find time to go through the chapter later. It's nice to have that. All right, I will send both in the chat. Um, okay. I just write the code. I didn't do any notes, so. If you fancy, I will do it tonight, probably. No, no, like just just drop them in. Just, uh, don't need any uh, work. Just drop them in. It's it's really helpful to drop them in, and you you don't need to make any homework for yourself. Um, okay. While everybody's here, can I uh, just confirm, Finn? You're up on the deck for next week. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much, everyone. Um. Richard. And I'll just uh, wait till I see those in the chat and then I'm going to log off myself. <clears throat> yeah, I just charging the. The. PPT, the PowerPoint.
Thank you, guys. Sweet. Thank you for thanks, the thanks a lot, Herman. See you, uh, see you soon. So we need to get a meeting on the on the books. So we probably should try to squeeze one in for next week. But um, send me an email and we'll schedule that for your project. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not going to be here next week, uh, uh, but right. we can do something online. Like we can do something. Well, let's uh, let's just arrange by email. It's just mentioning that since uh, we're all here together. Thank you. Uh, see you guys next week. Thank you.